Hello, Trailblazers, and welcome to another episode of Entrepreneur Journey. I am very pleased to have Jeremy Stretton. Is that how you say your last name? Jeremy Stretton. I, I usually ask my guests beforehand how to pronounce their last name. <laughs> so I'm glad I got this one right. Um, Jeremy, how are you today? I am very well, thanks, Doug. Thanks for having me. It, it is awesome to have you here. Um, before we get into, I'm gonna, I like to ask all our guests a little bit of personal questions, just kind of get to know them a little bit better before we dive into your journey. Um, Tell us a little bit about, about you and your business first before we dive into those. Yeah, so, so I'm based in Brisbane, Australia, uh, and uh, I have three businesses. I run a law firm, which I've had for about 10 years, and my background is in the legal profession. Uh, I do some mastermind work, some coaching just uh, with, a, with another business here. Uh, but the main business I'm here to talk about today is called the Business Legal Life Cycle. And it's a, a business that spun out of my law firm uh, about providing proactive advice to business owners. Because what I found, Doug, was that people in business, in it especially, are very reactive to law. They, they, they deal with problems when they arise. And it ends up costing them a lot of money. So the, the business that, I, that um, my passion really is to make legal advice accessible for all SMEs around the world. And the business legal life cycle is just the first step of that. And it's allowing business owners to understand what they need to do and how they can be proactive in their, in their business rather than just reacting to problems when they arise. Nice. Um, and we're going to dive into that um, in the interview as well. So um, be on the lookout for that, Trailblazers. Um, so let's dive into some of these um, just kind of getting to know you questions. What's a typical breakfast for you? Yeah, um, great question, Doug. I actually don't have breakfast. I do a thing mm. called intermittent fasting. So uh, uh, basically, I eat for six hours a day. Let's. Um, the theory is that you can basically eat anything that you want if you just um, do that. If I do have breakfast, so I do have breakfast um, every now and then with my children on the weekend. Um, it'll be like sausages and eggs. Like it'll be a bit of, bit of an indulgent breakfast <laughs> because um, I I don't eat breakfast every other day. Nice. That that's a very interesting answer. Um, you know, I, I don't ask that question a lot of guests, but I imagine like for, if someone was to ask me that, I would say it's very random. Some some days I'll have like a, a small pastry. Some days I'll have bacon and eggs. Some days um, I, I really some days I'll have a smoothie. Uh, so uh, I, I need to be more consistent, I think, in, in, my, in my breakfast. Um, so so the next question is, if you if you rubbed a magic lamp and a genie came out and gave you three wishes, what were those would those three wishes be? Yeah, you know, I've thought about this a lot, and and it's something that um, for me, I, I love those movies where yeah, you know, people say the wishes, and there's always like an unintended consequence. So, yeah. uh, when you when you propose this question to me, I've been I've been overthinking it, and but the first one would definitely be right now. We're, we're, yeah, we're doing this beginning twenty twenty two. It'd be get Russia out of Ukraine just mm. because I hate war, yeah. um, and that would be the very first, very very first thing I'd do. The second thing I would do would I, I would want to meet a, an an alien like life from another Ooh. planet. Because I, I'm really fascinated by space. I love science. I love all that stuff. And if there are aliens out there, I'd love to meet an alien. And then, I, and then, and then this is because I worry about the second order consequences. I'd actually save up my third one because one of those two things would cause a problem and I'd want to be able to stop that. Yeah, <laughs> at that stage. yeah. yeah. Uh, an alien likes, that likes to devour humans. Third wish is get yeah. this alien away from me. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So whatever that consequence of my decision is, I'd like to stop that with the third wish. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, so favourite place that you've ever visited? Yeah, so um, as an Australian, I've uh, Australians uh, love to travel because you, you have to, if you want to see any of the world, you've got to go a long way. Uh, and my favourite place uh, is New York. Uh, I've been there a couple of times, uh, including for New Year's one night. And I just love the big city. I wouldn't want to live there, but for me, it's a lovely place to visit. Uh, there's just so much to do, so much great food. We were talking about this before the call. So much great food. There's sights to see, and there's so many interesting people. So New York's been the favorite place I've visited so far. I've, I've got a follow up question to that. Since you said New York City, um, favorite restaurant or type of cuisine that you ate while you were in New York City? Oh, that's an excellent question. It's been a while since I've been there, so I can't remember the specific restaurant. I did go to Bubblegum Shrimp Co. for um, <laughs> New Year's one day, uh, but I wouldn't classify that. I would say my favourite cuisine uh, was like an Asian dish that, that mm. we had uh, when we went there. I love Asian food as well. I um, can't remember the name of the place, but I really love Asian food, so that, that's nice. where, I'd, where, where I'd go for that. I'm, I'm big on Italian food. Um, Italian. That's why I have to work out. <laughs> 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 um, so that, that's like, if I was to go to New York, I'd seek out a really good Italian place, I think. So, yeah, I believe there are lots there. So, yeah. <laughs> um, 
So now let's dive into your uh, journey as an entrepreneur, just kind of like where you started, um, what made you wanted to be an entrepreneur and where you are now. Just kind of give us the highlights, low lights, whatever you want to do. Yeah, so uh, I started, as, as I said before, I started as a lawyer and I started about 20 years ago now uh, as a lawyer. I uh, did that out of, out of university because I didn't really know what else I wanted to do, but I really found that I, I, I loved it. And I, I got a job as a, as in a small law firm that grew into a big law firm. And I didn't like the way that it went. I, I didn't like the, the big firm mentality. And my now business partner in the law firm and I, we decided that we could do things better as a lot of us entrepreneurs do. And so we, we decided to go and start our own business. And that was really the, the, the kick that we got was we realized that, especially for me, that I didn't want to be a partner in a big firm. I didn't want the big partner lifestyle. I wanted to run my own thing. I wanted to control my own destiny. And I wanted to, to uh, do that with people that I liked doing. And I couldn't do that in the big firm because the founding partners would always make all the decisions. Mm -hmm. So so that was the, the, the kicking in the pants. So I realized early on that I'd gotten myself in deep and I didn't know what I was doing. And so I got a coach uh, to help me. Uh, to run my business. I'm still with that coach now. And I mentioned before that I do a bit of mastermind coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually now work with him running some of his products. Like, so nice. over, over a 10 year journey, uh, I've now started working with him uh, and we're good mates as well. So that that works out really, really well for me. And, uh, and I actually get a lot of joy from helping that. But during that journey, I, uh, he said to me, his name is David Dugan. He, he said to me, Jeremy, one day you'll write a book. And I said, I laughed at him. He said, what lawyer writes a book? Like, who, who, you know, I'm not going to write a textbook. That's what lawyers write. And he just smiled at me. And then uh, yeah, just giving the brief notes about it, I, I had a couple of matters where I had some clients who, in one case, they lost over a million dollars of other people's money in, in, an, in an investment that they put together, property investment. And another one where they almost lost $2 million of their own money. And I asked them why they you know, didn't get legal advice because what the problems that they encountered, they could have solved really quickly if they just got proactive legal advice. And, you know, the old story, I didn't want to talk to a lawyer. I didn't understand it. They made me feel stupid. It was a cost. It really hit me. And it really, it really concerned me that, that people go down this journey, people fall into the rabbit hole of business and they don't go and get advice. That's really easy to get. And so I, I started uh, really analyzing that at the time it was about five and a half thousand businesses that I'd acted for over the years and mapped out when people did things well, when people did things poorly and mapped out this journey called the, the business legal life cycle. And then I had 13 phases and I had 13 chapters and I rang my, my business coach and said, you were right. I've got a book <laughs> so that I'm going to write. And yes. so I wrote the book and that, and that's, that's, that's precipitated my journey out of being a lawyer. I still do a little bit of legal work. Uh, that's precipitated my journey out of being a lawyer and to developing this business that, as I said before, is all about making legal advice accessible for SMEs around the world. And that's expanded to, I've written, I've, I've rewritten the book into the UK. So partnered with a UK lawyer uh, because they're the foundation of most laws around the world. And then partnered with a lawyer uh, from Florida, actually, to help me write the, uh, the US version of the book as well. Nice. So, uh, and, and that has, again, I've, I've worked my way out of being the lawyer in the law firm and then uh, really working on this business and, and helping as many business owners as we can around the world. Nice. Uh, a a follow-up question. Um, so the book is available in Australia. Is the UK version already published and the US version also already published? So they're all available on Amazon. Oh, uh, nice. And they're all, they're all available. I have actually written a South African version of it. Oh, uh, nice. And I was going over to meet with the lawyer to finalize it in March 2020. And then all plane flights stopped. So I haven't, oh, I haven't right. done that. And I've kind of just parked that. But in the near future, there'll be a South African version as well uh, that will help business owners. Nice. Um, so we're going to put the link to that book in the show notes if you're listening to this as a podcast. And it'll be below the video if you are uh, watching the video. So... I'll be sure to check out that book. If you're an entrepreneur, having sound legal advice is vital. So I highly recommend that. Um, we're going to dive in a little bit to some, some of that information about that's in the book, probably. So let's talk about that, that unique so uh, concept that you have about helping business with the legal matters. Uh, tell us more about, no, sorry. <laughs> tell us more about the business legal life cycle and how it helps small businesses. Yeah, so as I said before, Doug, uh, it's really about that proactive advice. So it's about educating business owners 
so that they know what they what they don't know. You know, uh, there's the old um, the old um, quadrant where it has the unknown unknowns and the known knowns and the, all that stuff. Uh, legal advice, what I've discovered is really in that unknown unknown bracket. It's you as a business owner don't necessarily know what you don't know. And right. the lawyer doesn't know about you what they don't know, obviously. So, so there's this unknown unknown area. And what I find is that because people deal with their legal uh, issues and risks in a reactive way, what happens is they just go to their lawyer uh, when there's a problem that arises. So what, we, what we've built and what we're building is re are resources and tools that help business owners to identify what they're missing and also for lawyers to help their clients to identify what they're missing as well. <clears throat> and, and so we really want to build those tools so that we can educate business owners. Uh, and, and I think from education comes, well, obviously comes knowledge, and then people are able to identify, okay, well, that might actually be a problem for me. So the book dives into, in each phase, what you need to do as a, as a very high level. Uh, you know, if, I, if I tried to go in and tell you how to do things in South Carolina, where you are, Florida, you know, Queensland, where I am, the UK, that would be the... You, you couldn't write that book because mm -hmm. there's just too many details. But a high, at a high level, it's all the same. So it's about understanding and education so that business owners can know what they, what they what, what's missing in their business. And for the lawyers out there who act for these clients, we, we have tools that allow them to actually do that work with their clients to find out what their, what their legal risks are. And then they can go and do the work to help uh, plug those holes so that we can really help them to build great businesses. Nice. Um, so my question, so the, the book is a resource. Can you, can you kind of expand on the outside of the book? You, you talked about tools, um, what the, the tools that are available to lawyers. Is there, is there another way to digest this material or get further help past the book, I guess is what I'm asking. Absolutely. So the first step is we have a, a, a life cycle. We call it a business legal life cycle um, risk assessment. And basically you answer 30 questions. It takes about 10 minutes. And it places you in the life cycle. So there are 13 phases and it might find you in phase five, which is protecting intellectual property. Uh, and then it says, okay, uh, based on the answers to your questions, you're missing this, this, and this. And uh, this is why you need to do something about that. Or in some circumstances, maybe you don't. So it might be registering a trademark. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe you don't actually need to tra register a trademark in, in certain circumstances. So the, the, the report tells you what you need to do. It then looks back at the other four phases that, uh, that you've been through and will say, okay, you've missed this or this or this from, from those phases. And again, it will tell you what you need to do, why you need to do it and who you need to speak to and gives you a checklist of the things that you need to do. And then it also says uh, for the future, what's the next phase and what do you need mm -hmm. to do there? So, so from then what we've built is an education course on the back of that, that then business owners can dive deeper into what they need to do and why they need to do it. And we have workbooks, uh, there's videos with me explaining the concepts, uh, why they're important and giving practical things that people can do to, to do all that. And on top of all of that, Doug, is a, a heap of free resources. Like we're, we're, we're producing uh, resources, uh, web pages uh, at a really large clip because we want to help people as much as we can, uh, that people can go in and, and see all that material. And, and really identify for us it's about self-identification of what the problems might be so that it then empowers business owners to go to their lawyer and go okay i need to do this let's do that and and then working with the lawyer to get the work done so so tell me if this statement would be true so if if i am a beginning business owner this would help me establish a firm legal foundation um going forward if if i've been in business for a while and i don't know where my legal vulnerabilities are right this will help me reaffirm my foundation would that be a, a good good statement to make yes it would uh, and it does work for startup business owners it's actually more aimed at the business owner who's been around for a couple of years okay uh, and and needs to then plug their their gaps uh, the reason for that is that there's, there's certain that there's certainly a startup phase phase two is startup mm -hmm. and there's certain things that people need to do and, and they should go and do that the test and the and all those tools work better if you've been in business for a little while, okay. so that you you understand some of the the, the nuances of what's happening in there. But it, it's certainly there's like the, the book and the free resources definitely work for for startup business owners to understand more. Okay, awesome. Um, so our audience is primarily entrepreneurs, and they have a lot of intellectual property. Some of them um, have self branded and, and things like that, and branded a lot of the digital products that they put out there. Uh, can you talk about how they go about protecting that? 
Not, so not legal see. advice. I, I'm not looking for you to give legal advice that, you know, you have to put a disclaimer on, uh, but, but you know this, what I this mean. Is this is general <laughs> advice. <Yeah. laughs> uh, and, and of course it is because we're on a podcast and, right. and I can't, you know, I can't tell everyone their personal circumstances, but at, at a general level, there are a couple of different types of intellectual property. There's a trademark. And a, a, when you register a trademark, whether it be in the, in the U S wherever, wherever in the world that you do it, you're protecting the use of that logo for your business and stopping other people from using that logo in competition with you. So think of the, the McDonald's golden arches. Classic example. Everyone knows what that is. Uh, if you, if, if I'm, well, I'm showing my age here a bit, but you know, one of my favorite uh, movies is Coming to America, the Eddie Murphy mm-hmm. movie, mm-hmm. and there was the business in there that was McDowell's. And, yep. you know, yep. yeah, I think in real life that would be that would never be allowed to happen because right. McDonald's has the, the golden arches. Uh, so, so, so. So that's a really important protection to have to register your trademark. You have protection of your logo, even if you haven't registered the trademark, if someone uses it to pretend that they're, your, that you, that they're mm. you as well. Um, and so you can register a trademark to basically gives you ownership for a period of 10 years over that, that symbol or that name or all the rest of that. that. That gets harder and harder as the years go by to protect because lots of other people have similar names of, mm-hmm. that, that you might want to protect. And as, as you yeah, know, the number of businesses explodes, you know, it becomes harder to have a unique name. And it's not always necessary to register a trademark either because the, and this, this can be a bit controversial with lawyers um, because <laughs> the, the strict legal advice is you should protect everything. Mm-hmm. But you should only do that in my view once you actually have a business that is sustainable and that you actually want to operate. I've had numerous businesses over the years where we've done their trademark when they started and two years into their journey, they've gone, I want to change the name. Um, and so then they've spent all this money protecting a trademark and then they've got to go and protect a brand new trademark. So I think I think you should register a trademark, but, but wait until you've established your business. And that's why we put it at phase five, Doug, in the, in the life cycle, because the first four phases are, are conception, startup, bringing on employees, sorry, not bringing on, initial clients, then bringing on employees and then protecting IP. So you've got to, once you bring on employees, you start to get a, a, a business that's sustainable. So that's when, when you should start protecting it. So that's the, that's the first bit of intellectual property, um, the trademark. Uh, another really quick one is patents. So you can protect a process if you have a unique process in your business or product. Uh, you can protect that process if it's, if it's truly inventive. They're, they're getting uh, the same trademarks. They're getting harder and harder to get. Uh, but yeah, if you've got a truly unique process, then definitely do that. And the third one for me is uh, the material about how you do your business. So uh, you get, whenever you create something, you get copyright in the, what we call the expression of the idea. This is a little bit of a legal nuance as we call it. And uh, basically if you got my book, The Business Legal Lifecycle, and you reproduced it in exactly the same form, right? I could stop you from doing that because I have I own the copyright in that in that material. However, if you got the thirteen phases and you changed them around and, and made a few made a few twigs here and didn't use the same wording and expressed it differently, I can't stop you from doing that because I'm I'm only I've only got ownership over the expression of the idea. And it's it's a common misconception out there. Ideas, you know, ideas are great. You know, it, it, you know, there's thousands of ideas out there. But what what copyright does is it protects the expression of the idea. Which is the real thing that you want to protect. So, uh, what I find is that uh, you want to protect that as best you can. Now, there's nowhere to go and register that or anything. What you do is you just you just prove that you came up with it, and know that when you implement that intellectual property, that's your unique um, value because ideas are a dime a dozen. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Um, and I and I can I'm right with you on the uh, logo thing or the branding because this is the third iteration of my company. Um, I started out as Archimedia because I had a business partner and that he was Archimedes as a mathematician. He really liked Archimedes. Um, and, you know, once he left, I, I wasn't keen on that idea. And then I, I, I like superheroes. And then we did something around superheroes, like superhero marketing. Um, but, you know, that was, you know, it, it ended up feeling a little juvenile to me, just to be honest. Um, so then I was waiting on this domain name to be available. And uh, when it was, that's when we decided to rebrand to to sales site. So um, that that's kind of the, the, my journey as far as as far as that. Um, There's another question I had for you based on what you said of oh, and I don't. It, this doesn't really apply to entrepreneurs. It's just kind of my um, my question in general. Uh, music, right? You you hear the the 
lawsuits all the time about someone using this piece of music and somebody else's thing and it sounds similar so is that kind of what you're talking about like it's they may have used it in a different way but is, is that what's your take on that um my take on that is it's it, it's very complicated okay. <laughs> it's very very complicated and it's not my not my area of expertise, but I do yeah. know enough about it to, to speak um, somewhat intelligently. Yeah. And what, what I would say is that you know, direct out copying the music is obviously a, a breach of copyright. So if you've got a song from, I don't know, Led Zeppelin or something and took took a, a, a portion out of that, then you can't do that. If you took, a, there are there are what we call fair use exemptions, mm -hmm. where say if you wanted to use it for, you know, three seconds because you wanted to, to use it as an example so um, I listen to Seth Godin's podcast and he mm -hmm. often uses music and he makes the point that he doesn't have to get permission to use the music that he uses on the podcast because he's only using it for a small a mm. small portion of it and to make a point right and giving complete credit to the other person so that's called fair use same with universities I could go on um, okay uh, but but like actually like say say an artist wants to get a song and redo it themselves there's not really any protection that the that the original artist has in that music uh, because it's just it's the it's an idea and and you want to protect the expression of the idea there are so many nuances though Doug there's probably listeners going no that's not right and and it's, and it's not right yeah. in every situation I'm just giving giving a general a general overview um, but yeah that's that's in the general sense you can you definitely can protect the expression of the music but the actual you know how, how how it's played and all the rest of that and, and the actual song uh is very different and, and very okay. different protections and there are a whole there are whole uh law firms that are, are based around trying to have those arguments so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh so my next question is um what do many entrepreneurs miss as far as um from a legal standpoint yeah I think I think the main thing, and and it may not sound like legal advice, but it actually is actually really important for the legal advice. The, the main thing that people miss out on is thinking about what's their end goal, what's the journey that they're trying to go on. And I love the expression from uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I think it's Habit Two, and he says, you know, start with the end in mind. I take a different, a slightly different take on it, and that's start up with an end in mind. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is that. You want to have some goal because if you don't have a goal of where you think you want to go, then you'll you'll never achieve it. The problem is that you know whoever knows exactly where they want to be in life. You know, like uh, Stephen in his, in his book, he talks about you know write the letter that, you know, as if it's your eulogy at at, at, um, at your funeral. I find that for most people is a very scary prospect because life will change. You know, if you told me ten years ago when I started my law firm that I'd be talking to you on a podcast today and doing this business, I would have laughed at you. Um, so, so start, but you need to have some idea about where you're going. You need to start with some sort of end in mind because that then, when, when a lawyer is giving you advice, they need to know where you want to head and what you want to do. It, it determines everything from the structure that you use because there are different tax consequences. If you want to start a business to sell it in two years time, there's a different structure to something that you want to operate as a business for the next 20 years. Uh, you know, the decisions about your clients and how you engage with them, you know, again, depends on what's your goal? What do you want to achieve? Do you want to get a client you know, in 2022 and you'll be working with them in 2024 or 2024 or 2042 or, or whenever? It's a very different structure that you need to, to start out with. So honestly, Doug, I, I, it's not really legal advice, but it's, it's so important because it really then sets the direction of, of everywhere that you're going to go and everything that you need to set up and know that that will change and you might need to, to change things up. But really understanding the starting point and then the ending point is the, is the key to, to getting the right legal advice. And then there's things like just documenting contracts. Uh, you know, so, so you know, in phase two initial clients and uh, so phase three initial clients and phase four bring on employees, I talk about the fact that when you get a first client or you get an employee, you're so keen to get in there and start doing the work or, or onboarding the employee, you've got to have a contract in place because what you agree with your client or uh, employee straight up might be all fine and it's all, it's all good. But inevitably, as you go on that journey, as you, you know, the entrepreneur journey, you will encounter problems. You know, mm -hmm. I like to think of it in the hero's journey, the, um, yeah. the Joseph Campbell hero's journey. And you know, you'll hit that dark night of the soul. There'll be some disagreement. If you don't have a contract, it's all an argument over he said, she said, and, and where things are going to go. And that just, that, 
that makes lawyers rich because it makes it, it means that you're in a dispute and then there's a fight to be had and then you, you know you have to you have to sort that out or you just lose a bunch of money so document your agreements early on so that in the future everyone understands where where everyone's up to nice i i love that advice and it's a it's about protecting both parties right a lot of people see it as the it's the employer protecting himself it's actually you're, you're actually you're protecting the employee as well or the client and not just correct protecting the business owner, but protecting the client as well. So um, absolutely, because the client, the clients, you know, people change what they want and, and, uh, and relationships evolve. So you just need to have that base, that base thing. And, and what I'd say is that think of those agreements as a disagreement uh, using better comments <laughs> for people who are um, listening to us, uh, because you want to think about what happens when the parties disagree and how we're going to resolve those, those disputes. You can never in a contract have, the, the, every single working of every single part of the relationship. But what you want to do is you want to go, these are the fundamental uh, non-negotiables. And then what happens if we disagree down the track and really map that out so that you you can resolve any dispute very quickly. Nice. Yeah. I just um, was on a call earlier with someone that um, had a business partner that they developed a contract. Um, and it's, it's important to read contracts too. I'm going to say that because uh, the business partner ended up owning the majority of the company and he got pushed out of it because of the way the contract was structured. So um, it's important to have contracts in place and then understand those contracts when they're, when they're done. So, yeah, I mean, read, read through it. And if you don't understand, go and talk to a lawyer go yeah. and talk, or, or a coach or something, something get a second opinion. Um, make sure it works the way that you want it to work because yeah, I've seen it far too often <laughs> where people, yeah. Oh, I didn't read the contract. Well, you signed it. You shouldn't have yeah. signed it if you didn't read it. So. And now you have no recourse because. <laughs> and, in, and in fact, this came up in one of my mastermind groups just yesterday. When you, when you, if you're, a, if you're signing an agreement with a client, you should actually work through that agreement with the client mm -hmm. and make sure that they understand it and they ask you any questions. In, 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 in this discussion we were having yesterday, uh, one of, one of my clients was, uh, he was asking for advice. I was going to say complaining. He was complaining a little bit, but he was asking for advice about, a business owner who he was contracting with who wanted to make all these changes to his agreement. And the advice from the mastermind group was you need to sit down and explain it to them uh, clause by clause so that they understand what they're, what, what they're getting into and you can explain any of these issues and you save yourself so much time down the track. And the great thing, Doug, is you ensure that they've read it, <laughs> yep. Because, yep. because they do it. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, so nothing comes out as a shock. <laughs> That's right. So. Awesome. Awesome. So thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for being on the entrepreneur journey. Do you have any parting words for our audience? Um, I think just remember that you know, the ostrich approach of putting your head in the sand doesn't work with legal matters. It ends up costing you a lot more. So what you want to make sure that you do is that you educate yourself so that you know what the problems could be. And, uh, and then you work with your lawyer uh, to, to plug those holes so that you can, uh, you know, sleep better at night really and 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 have a risk-free or not not a risk-free business but reduce the risks in your business nothing's ever risk-free uh but you can definitely reduce the risks and the common mistakes that people make uh you can definitely fix that up nice and again i want people to know uh where they can go to either get the book or mm. get further um i guess further help on with the business what's it, the business legal life cycle yeah, great. Um, so uh, they can download the book from, or they can buy the book from Amazon. Uh, we also have a website, businesslegallifecycle.com. Uh, as a thank you for having me on the show, uh, we've put together a page uh, called uh, Business Legal Lifecycle slash Entrepreneur Journey as one word. Uh, and that has access to, to a lot of our resources. It also, I mentioned earlier, our assessment um, that, we, that we have. It's, we normally charge $97 for that. You get about $1,000 worth of legal value. So if you get a lawyer wow. to actually ask those questions and produce the report, you're looking at about $1,000. We normally charge $97. As a thank you for being on here and, and for your listeners, uh, they can do that test for 50%. Uh, nice. a fifty percent discount. Uh, so you just go onto that website. There's a code there, and it takes shows you what you need to do. Uh, so that gets in, and it'll give you the report that'll say this is what you need to do from from your business uh, or in your business from a legal perspective, and then it will give you that report so that you can take it to your to your lawyer. And if you don't have a lawyer, uh, we have a referral service as well. Uh, so we have a, a great network around around well all three countries: US, Australia, and the UK. And we can refer you to a lawyer that, that will be able to help you as well. Nice. I was that was going to be my next question. If you had the referral network, 
That's it. That is really cool. So that link will be below the video if you're watching this on video and of course in the show notes. So please make sure to go check out the show notes and go to that link um, and get st- get your business protected for, for now and for the future. So uh, thank you again, Jeremy and Trailblazers. Until next time, keep moving forward.